Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. Hey, you fellow Portuguese. Actually, no, I don't speak Portuguese, but I, in, in remembrance of my uh, Portuguese instructor from West Point who spent two years trying to teach me Brazilian Portuguese, he would just be so proud to know that I remembered something. Um, so we should give him a round of applause. Can you, come on. <laughs> so the, you know, the reason why they taught Brazilian Portuguese at, uh, at the military academy at West Point was because um, for decades, in defense of the Western Hemisphere, America's strongest and most resilient partner was Brazil. And to see those days with us again, to me, is just extraordinary and remarkable. So my name's Jim Carafano. I oversee all the foreign and uh, security policy here at the Heritage Foundation. And we are honored to host Ambassador um, Arroyo, uh, Brazil's foreign minister, for his first public address in Washington, D.C. The first uh, minister the, and the first foreign minister and the first senior official that we've ever had at the Heritage Foundation for Brazil. This is such a great honor and historic moment. Um, the ambassador will know that this is a tremendous privilege for us to hear from you today um, as you lay out Pre President Bolsonaro's international strategy and his agenda for the U.S.-Brazil relationship. And over the last nine months, um, we have seen firsthand um, an incredible transformation of bilateral relationship that I, I don't think is actually maybe even in, matched in modern history. So, so I was told that when, when um, President Bolsonaro was here for the, the state visit, you know, at the end of these things, you got to like do a, like a statement or like put out a communique or something. And normally these things are, everybody shook hands and we had a great time, right? So they're, they, they were stuck because it, the statement was three pages long which is just incredible, just because there was such an amazing long list of deliverables and so many things that these two great leaders wanted to accomplish. The US intent to designate Brazil as a major non-NATO ally. Uh, Brazil planning to exempt US citizens from tourist visa requirements, uh, trade commitments, and most importantly, the Technology Safeguards Agreement was finalized after 20, 20 years, not 20 months, 20 years of dialogue, a treaty which allows US companies to launch satellites and ro rockets into space from Brazil. And as many of you know, this, that since space is literally the, 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 the most exciting part of kind of the human community and, and our, where we go to, to have that kind of cooperation and r right now is really just incredible and remarkable. Beyond the visit, there continues to be shared sense of purpose, driving both our capitals to deepen the bilateral relationship we see this with Brazil cooperation in addressing the crisis in Venezuela, finding responsible solutions for dealing with China's growing presence in Latin America, and Rob broadly to see that the two largest democracies in the Western Hemisphere reach a historic level of cooperation and trust. Again, Ambassador, it is such a real privilege to host you here today. Please join with me in welcoming the Foreign Minister. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to uh, express my thanks for uh, Heritage. It's really a, an honor to be uh, here in this August Hall. Uh, my thanks to uh, President Kay James, uh, Vice President Jay Carafano, and uh, all the staff that uh, made this possible. Uh, I uh, would start by saying that I, I uh, just realized it's 9-11, uh, it's so before uh, really starting, I would like to uh, express our uh, our sentiments in memory of the uh, the victims of that uh, terrible day. Um, I also remember uh, one year afterwards, uh, so 2002, uh, I saw the uh, cover of, uh, I think it was Foreign Policy magazine, and the uh, cover article said, uh, about 9-11, of course, the day nothing much changed. Uh, and... Uh, well, it's, a, it's a way of seeing it, right? But uh, I think since then we are trying to uh, to get a sense of what happened that day and uh, what changed and what did not change. And uh, some of the things that I'm about to say maybe also uh, are part of uh, an on ongoing speculation about uh, uh, everything that changed uh, in the world in the last uh, two decades. Uh, so uh, Brazil is back. I believe that's the, the title that uh, I gave to this uh, speech. Uh, back to uh, where we never were, but where we th feel that we belong, 
and we think that maybe all nations belong. In any case, we feel that we are back to the center of the fight. And we feel that Brazil is a part uh, of a global process that I'll try to describe a little bit. Uh, we can say that it uh, started back in 2013 when uh, Brazilians went to the streets uh, spontaneously by the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, without being able to voice entirely what they uh, were rising against. Uh, uh, and for reasons that were certainly far larger than the uh, immediate reasons of the revolt, more or less like the, uh, the Boston Tea Party, perhaps. It was the rise of what the equivalent of uh, five cents in the price of bus tickets that sparked a movement, uh, a movement that in a sense is still going on in Brazil. Uh, a movement that at first the, uh, the left tried to uh, dominate and to harness, but went out of control, fortunately, and became a revolt against uh, a whole system whose corruption was uh, still not totally clear, but of which the, the people, in their wisdom, had the intuition already. It was a revolt against the political economic system, which didn't deliver the services or economic opportunities that people wanted, in spite of its uh, social-oriented rhetoric, but also a cultural revolt against the ownership of public discourse by politically correct media. Uh, in an information society, whoever controls the discourse controls the power. And the people started to realize that in Brazil back in 2013. People went to the streets to protest, to, uh, to protest against something. Uh, they didn't know exactly what, I think. Uh, that's what protests normally are, I think. And they didn't get what they wanted because they, they didn't know exactly what, what it was. But when they came home, uh, they went into social media and they never left. And they're still there. We are still there. Uh, and this is changing the country and uh, is part of a, a world change. The people trying to ascertain their power over the discourse against the political economic system and against the media which control each other, the, the political economic system and the media. Uh, and a uh, uh, duo that still try to control the people. This spontaneous movement re-emerged in 2015 in the shape uh, of the protests for Dilma Rousseff's impeachment and destitution. It had a, already a strong nationalist vein which went beyond the simple removal of a detested leader. It was against the regime uh, of the Workers' Party, which is an Orwellian designation, since we were at it, because no workers were ever seen inside the Workers' Party. Uh, it was uh, against the Gramscian state in which Brazil had turned, a system of state control of the economy and media control of the culture. They got Dilma removed from office. I think I can say we got Dilma removed from office, all Brazilians. and. Um, some people back then thought, well, this is it. But it was not it. It was not over. The uh, Workers' Party was replaced at the top, but the system stayed on. People continued to strongly support the fight against corruption, which was going on, the Lava Jato operation, which later got Lula convicted for corruption and sentenced to uh, 11 years in jail, uh, a term that he is now serving, as you know. Uh, people uh, embraced the rule of law as a banner like never before. Uh, and they kept pressing for a total cleaning up of the system. So uh, they, uh, they realized that uh, it was more than just removing a president from office, that uh, what was at stake was the, uh, the connection between the uh, age old system of uh, the uh, economic, political uh, uh, give and take system uh, and the uh, Pact of uh, that system with the uh, uh, some sort of uh, hegemonic social project. Uh, that was Brazil. But then in 2016 came, of course, the Brexit vote and Trump's election. And few people realized back then, but uh, I think this showed that Brazil was already part of something bigger, or something more universal in nature. There was, and still is, I think, the uh, 
uh, sort of zeitgeist for freedom across the world. The same movement reemerged around uh, Jair Bolsonaro's candidacy. And from 2017, it became increasingly clear that he was the only political leader ca capable of uh, bringing the people to power, the only one who believed in freedom, in nationhood, and in God, and in their interaction. We may say, we may say that uh, Trump and Bolsonaro are part of the same insurgency, what I would call the universal insurgency against bullshit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think that's true. Here and there and elsewhere, uh, in Brazil, in the US, elsewhere, people fight for something else than the economy, something else than just getting rid of corruption, something else, just, uh, something else than just getting their, their jobs back. But what is it that mobilized Brazilians, Brexiters, and uh, US MAGA voters? Uh, I think it's... Uh, Put in a more elegant term, it's a revolt against ideology. Uh, the realization that we uh, had been lied to, that we had been despised by an elite that tried to rule us and abate us in the name of social justice or in the name of European integration or in the name of a borderless world, in the name of pro pro progress or whatever. All high sounding names that are there not to describe the reality but to impose a certain power structure into reality. Uh, if you believe in Toynbee's theory of civilization advanced by challenge and response, what is the challenge, the big threat that uh, not only Brazil or the US or the United Kingdom or any other country, but the big threat that our civilization now faces? Some people would say climate change. It's not absolutely not true. The big challenge is ideology. In 1989 and uh, immediately afterwards, it seemed that Western civilization had overcome its biggest challenge, Soviet communism. In the ensuing peace, without a challenge, the West started to stagnate. It started to splurge. Without the need to fight for life or death, it started to make mistakes without any consequences or thinking they didn't have any consequences. It made huge mistakes in the diagnosis of what had ensured its victory. It thought it was only the economy that had ensured the West's victory, and ignored the culture. It ignored, for example, Ronald Reagan's advice in his farewell speech. He thought that the uh, Christian faith had nothing to do with it, when it clear, clearly was a huge part of the West's success, as St. Pope John Paul II's fight clearly shows. His actions against communism uh, were not uh, political. Uh, his action against communism was not a political action under religious pretexts, but rather religious faith-based action with some political instruments. In any case, the West opened the ground for the emergence uh, of the new challenge, the emergency of the new challenge, uh, in the shape of what today I believe we can call uh, globalism. Uh, in general, we can say that uh, globalism is what came to be the uh, amalgam of the uh, globalized economy with uh, cultural Marxism infiltrated in the institutions. So basically, globalization, economic globalization hijacked by cultural Marxism. In Brazil, uh, globalism took the shape of a slightly different amalgam, that of the, uh, that I spoke a little bit about, the traditional corrupt system of patronage, uh, but dominated by uh, a uh, Gramscian, Gramscian left infiltrated in the cultural institutions. Uh, in Brazil, they uh, infiltrated what we uh, used to call the physiological state. I don't know if that makes sense in English. Brazilians here will know what I, what I mean. The physio physio physiologism is uh, the way we uh, uh, name this uh, system of, of patronage, of, uh, of straight controlled uh, economy. So uh, what we had in Brazil was basically uh, uh, a disguised, more or less disguised, state control of the economy uh, and control of public discourse. A uh, closed economy and its uh, subser subservient, subservient insertion into a globalized system uh, inside that sort of um, uh, political control of the means of discourse production. 
uh, when the people realized what was going on, the system tried to sell a bunch of more or less centrist candidates, promising all of them half-heartedly to fight a little bit the corruption and to liberalize a little bit the economy. They didn't, people didn't buy it and went on, went to the uh, only one outside of the system, the one who is really there to break the corrupt system and to create a real capitalist economy, the one who is breaking the politically correct spell that uh, was used to keep people inside of the system without noticing it. Uh, I think we are creating in Brazil what we call uh, the liberal conservative amalgam, liberal in the Brazilian sense, not in the American sense, liberal in the sense of economic liberalism. Uh, and this amalgam is the first real chance we ever had to really have a prosperous economy inside a healthy, confident society. I'm sure that only in a society of trust and confidence you can have a thriving, open economy. Only on top of nationhood, family, traditional ties, you can have a functioning capitalist economy. Globalism wants to uh, sell us the inco incompatibility of those goals, and we are disproving that thesis. In the uh, US, the uh, globalist program worked differently, not mainly, I think, through state control, as in Brazil, but mainly through the destruction of American manufacture and its technological base, thanks to globalization also coupled with the uh, destruction or erosion of traditional ties and values. But just like in Brazil, it was also about a subservient insertion in the globalized economy and the shutting up of dissenting voices at the cries of fascist or racist. Um, so uh, one, one way of, uh, of seeing, a, a slightly different way of seeing this, uh, the challenge uh, facing our civilization uh, is uh, the following. Uh, our civilization is uh, losing its symbols. It's losing its symbolic dimension. I'm not talking about religion, but religious life requires the symbolic dimension. Uh, we don't seem to be able to generate symbols or to live symbolically uh, nowadays. What are symbols? Symbols are basically figures that guide us from above, that make our life complex and three-dimensional. Symbols are like uh, signal towers or satellites that allow us to find our way uh, in reality, like some sort of intellectual GPS. Um, so, um, uh, uh, I was reading recently a, a very important book to understand what is at stake? It's a book of, by uh, Ernesto Laclau and Chantal Mouffe about uh, uh, the concept of hegemony. Those are people who, are, uh, who try to reinvent Marxism. And whenever we talk about uh, cultural Marxism, like we we're talking here, it's uh, an important reference to understand it. And um, I, uh, uh, I, I found, I found a, a note that I made on the side that. Uh, it's kind of too good to be, to be mine, so I, I don't think I wrote that. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll quote from this uh, uh, unknown source in the comment to that book. That, uh, since Rosa Luxemburg, so in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, communism ceased to be an economic theory and became a process of symbolic confiscation. Uh, uh, what... Uh, what is this uh, theory of hegemony that I talked about? The theory of hegemony is a culmination of that process. Uh, Laclau and, and Chantal Mouffe are basically, as I said, the creators of 21st century socialism. So that's basically the theory that you have to transfer the social strife uh, from the economy to other uh, realms of, uh, of society. Uh, and uh, a good example of what it brings to is Venezuela, of course. Venezuela was considered to be a successful example of 21st century socialism, and it is a very successful example of 21st century socialism. Uh, why? Because they just don't care at all about economic success as long as they attain that symbolic success, that success in destroying the symbolic. Uh, they want to destroy society. 
to prove and to impose their power. Uh, in a way, it's like the cultural revolution of the 60s. Uh, destruction is the goal, not the byproduct. They want to create terror, to break the limits of decency, and still hold to power and thus show their power. What bigger affirmation of power can there be? So uh, hegemony uh, also means that. Uh, it means that the, uh, the left lost the people, and they don't care. So let's replace the people, they say like uh, Brecht uh, used to say in one of his uh, plays. Of course, he said that uh, as a mockery and a criticism of uh, bourgeois regimes, but uh, as in many cases of uh, left-wing theory, uh, what they're criticizing is actually what they're preaching. So uh, the idea is let's despise the people and let's humiliate its values and let's humiliate the people in order to break their spirit and to subjugate the people. This is the new logic of the social, to quote from that book. Uh, the new logic of the social is basically that, Marxism without the people. The revolutionary avant-garde is not where economic theory would determine, because there's the, uh, the capital-labor relations is no, never was, maybe, but today is clearly not what the theory prescribes. So the, um, the, today the re revolutionary avant-garde is uh, whatever the resistance of the enemy, the common people, is. Whatever the resistance is weaker, actually. So uh, the avant-garde is in moral values, for example, uh, due to uh, people's natural kindness. It is in uh, uh, the realm of uh, immigration, also where people uh, by nature tend to be kind and not notice uh, uh, ideology penetrating. Uh, very seriously, in, in Latin America today, the uh, avant-garde is also associated with uh, organized crime, uh, with narco or drug trafficking and, and so forth. So uh, and, and they, that's also part of the design. I mean, they want to be whatever they can be the most brutal and the most shocking. So uh, to close that uh, digression into 21st century socialism, I can say that 21st century socialism is basically that. It's Gramsci meets the drug cartels. Uh, so um, back to the uh, question of the, the symbols and losing the symbols. Uh, you may say that, well, okay, without the, uh, what's the problem? Without symbols, we still have reality, but we don't. That's wrong. Without symbols, we have only what is in front of us, and that is not reality. Without symbols, we uh, have only words left. Words without reality, words as mere, mere triggers for hatred or fear. Without symbols, we fall prey to self-replicating sub-ideas, those that uh, Richard Dawkins used to call memes before the word meme acquired the sense that it has today over the internet. Um, without symbols, we are the uh, unidimensional man of uh, Herbert Marcuse. And here we come again to that example of Marxists because he wrote that book in the 60s denouncing the consumerist society, but actually I think it was a, a, a program for establishing the uni, uh, unidimensional man. Um, the, uh, I think the, the whole Frankfurt School is uh, about that, is about to denouncing what deep inside they want to create. Uh, see, for example, also the book Empire by uh, Hart and Negri, uh, or the idea of biopolitics in Michel Foucault and the Panopticon. Uh, although people say Michel Foucault is not a Marxist, but I think. I think it's part of the same cultural universe. Uh, the idea of the panopticon, which he describes as something terrible, a, a, a dystopian future where uh, from uh, a central point you can control the whole society, but that's what they are trying to create. Um, also, uh, George Lukács, The uh, Destruction of Reason, where he tries to describe where, uh, how uh, the uh, uh, rise of uh, national socialism in Germany uh, destroyed uh, thinking, and I think that's also a program of action. They want to destroy reason. It's not by accident. Um, so for the uh, unidimensional man, there are only words, and words are the reality. Uh, for him, for example, man and woman are just words, and they are interchangeable. So that's what gives rise to the gender ideology. Uh, for them, there is no essence, because essence belongs to the realm of the symbolic uh, 
And that's where we were at. Uh, globalism is the world without symbols. That's another way of, of saying it. Um, and uh, that's where uh, nationalism comes in as uh, the, uh, maybe the main convergence of forces that oppose globalism. Because the nation is still one of the uh, very few symbols that we have left, although battered and attacked, but there's still a symbol that, that makes sense and that sends us some signals from above to help us organize reality in a more complex uh, way. Uh, so, our, uh, so uh, coming back to the, uh, or coming to the instruments of, uh, of globalism. Uh, today, I think globalism works through uh, three main instruments. Uh, one is uh, climate change ideology, or climatism, to use another word, distinct from climate change itself as a, as a phenomenon, natural phenomenon, scientifically observable. Uh, another is gender ideology, and another is what uh, some people call uh, oikophobia, to distinguish from xenophobia. It's the, uh, the hatred of one's own nation, and uh, uh, as a part of that, the theory of uh, or the uh, claim of a, for a borderless world. But let's uh, concentrate on what is more pressing today, I think, of those, which is uh, uh, climatism or climate change ideology. Just to insist, one thing is what I call climatism, the other, or other people also call the other is climate change. So, um, um, is there climate change? Yes, certainly there's, there has always been. Is it man-made? Uh, many people say yes, we don't know for sure. The uh, uh, computer models based on the assumption of a high sensitivity of temperature to CO2 are almost of them wrong. Uh, according to Dr. Patrick Michaels, if I'm not mistaken, among the uh, 102 computer models that try to simulate the behavior of temperature in function of uh, CO2, among the 102 models, 101 are wrong over the overestimated the, uh, the increase in temperature. But that's okay. I mean, that's uh, something that's scientifically uh, uh, observable or, or can be discussed or should be discussed, I think. Uh, but in any case, uh, is this change catastrophic to the point of requiring the worst sacrifices, as is said nowadays? Uh, it doesn't seem to be so according to... Uh, the, uh, uh, one of the main documents of uh, the, uh, the climate uh, debate, which is the IPCC last report, the 2018 IPCC report in, the, uh, in its summary for policymakers uh, says the following. I'm sorry, I have to open here my iPad to quote. Uh, it says, Trends in intensity and frequency of some climate and weather extremes have been detected over time, uh, have been detected over time spans during which about 0.5 degrees centigrade of global warming occurred. Medium confidence, because every statement in the uh, IPCC reports, they classify high, medium, or, or low confidence. So there is medium confidence that trends in intensity and frequency of some climate and weather extremes have been detected in a period that uh, basically uh, is not, since 1950. Uh, so, uh, doesn't seem like a climate a catastrophe to, to me at least. Uh, but from the debate that's going on, it would seem that the world is ending. Uh, and that's uh, the whole point of climatism. The whole point of climatism is ending political, normal, normal political democratic debate. The, uh, Conveyors of that ideology want to create a moral equivalent of war in order to impose policies and restrictions that run counter to fundamental liberties. Uh, because Brazilians, Brexiters, and most Americans, among others, are no longer buying the traditional lies of the system, the traditional power scheme is in its, uh, uh, so the, the traditional power scheme in its ordinary package, uh, now the system is trying to change the package and to paint, in, uh, paint it in more dramatic colors. They want us to believe that uh, we are in a war for the survival of the planet, and any sacrifice is warranted, including the sacrifice of freedom of speech, 
which is probably the main goal of the system, since they want, above all, to control the scores, as we have seen. Um, so after all the awful experiences around the world in socialism, how can, one, how can someone dream of imposing socialist control of the economy in a country like the United States, for example? Never through democratic debate, of course. Only through a declaration of emergency. So, climate crisis, they cry. Uh, how can uh, someone in a time of peace uh, dream of breaking the sovereignty of a country like Brazil over its own territory? Saying, oh, the Amazon is on fire again, again, because of ideology, because of this uh, primeval cry of cr climate crisis, let's save the planet. Uh, so, uh, climate became not a scientific concept, it became a debate shudder, a word that when you pronounce it, you end debate and you, you win the argument without having to prove you're right. Uh, uh, the system turned uh, the climate change batteries against President Trump and against President Bolsonaro because they are the main ones probably fighting the system. Brazil is out of the globalist pact. The US is out of the globalist pact. So they come after us, trying to reduce us and uh, lead us back into the pact. Uh, in the case of Brazil, the uh, reasoning runs like this. There is a climate crisis, climate crisis, catastrophic climate crisis. It's due to global warming. Global warming is due to CO2 emissions. CO2 emissions are due to deforestation. Deforestation is due to Brazil burning the Amazon. So let's invade Brazil, as was proposed in an article in Foreign Policy. Uh, so, of course, everything is good and everything is uh, uh, advisable against a country that is des destroying the planet, right? So, war, trade sanctions, what else? The fact is that uh, many, if not all, steps of that reasoning uh, are wrong or, or at least questionable. Brazil is not burning the forest. Fires are on average. Deforestation is responsible for only about, 18, uh, only about 11 percent of CO2 emissions worldwide. And Brazilian deforestation is responsible for less than 2 percent of CO2 emissions worldwide. So even if you assume that CO2 emissions directly control temperature, which the uh, computer models don't show, Brazil is not the culprit. And even if CO2 directly control emissions, there doesn't seem to be a climate crisis, not according to the IPCC report. But it doesn't matter. The word climate has been pronounced and debate has been silenced. Now, only the masters of the scores can speak. Shut up, they explained. <laughs> uh, that's not my expression. I, I, I read it somewhere. I think it's a, a good way of right? uh, So, um, the system still manages to maintain a lot of people not many, but a lot of people into, in some kind of collective hypnosis. The system shows, for example, the word nation, and the hypnotized crowd responds, no, no, bad, Hitler. The system shows the word migration, and the crowd responds, good, good, diversity, without the possibility of discussing, okay, there are pros and cons to migration, there are pros and cons to nationalism, but that's impossible to discuss. There's only the uh, automatic reactions that are allowed. Uh, uh, the system shows the picture of a forest on fire, a picture from 20 years ago, but pretends it is Brazil today. And people react, Brazil is bad, bad. Lung of the world, that's invaded. It's like uh, we're living in a, some sort of zombie apocalypse where people can discuss things. The system can train less and less people to respond automatically like that in hypnosis. But they still have the media. I'm sorry, the media here. I'm, I'm not talking about you. I mean, the media in general. <laughs> okay? Uh, and, the, uh, and the media is uh, still an echo chamber, uh, influencing other media and some decision makers, but some key decision makers, uh, including some corporate decision makers who can make completely wrong decisions, like senseless, senseless uh, threats of boycotts, for example, uh, against Brazil, because they are hyp hyp hypnotized. Uh, because many decision makers don't react to real people. They react to the media and think the media conveys the voice of the people. 
uh, international law itself is under serious threat when uh, uh, a leader tweets a 20-year-old picture saying it's uh, the Amazon on fire now, and the echo chamber immediately starts calling for breaking of Brazil's sovereignty uh, or for retaliations against our products without any base on any treaty or instrument. Is, it looks like a Stalinist revolutionary justice to me. Right? Accuse, execute. Uh, but uh, you'd say, oh, but where's justice? Where's the rule of law? People would say, climate crisis, shut up. Uh, it's the precautionary principle, in a way. I think uh, Stalin and other dictators uh, used very well the precautionary principle. They just killed a lot of people uh, uh, without bothering if they were really a threat to their system. Right? I think that's the good use of the precautionary system. Uh, based on that same sort of uh, Stalinist reasoning, the media and some politicians are starting to uh, demonize meat for example. Someone suggested we should resort to cannibalism to save the planet by not consuming bovine meat, which destroys the Amazon in their narrative. Uh, so did we really come to that point? Uh, do they want us to all to eat silent green? After using climate change to control energy supplies, to limit country sovereignty, do they want to use it to control what people eat? What more invasive and more efficient than that? Uh, where is human dignity in there? Where is the sense of justice? Where is common sense? Uh, the psychoanalyst uh, Jacques Lacan uh, said, in a different context, but I think it's a good quote, he said, if God doesn't exist, nothing is permitted. It's the opposite of traditional Dostoevsky quote, where uh, he said, if God doesn't exist, everything is permitted, which the, uh, the book itself, Crime and Punishment shows it's not true. But Lacan said, if God doesn't exist, nothing is permitted. So, and that's what we're seeing. Take away man's symbolic dimension. I, I mean, I don't mean God as a symbol, in my view, but I, I think, in a way, you need the symbolic dimension to relate to God and to perceive the idea of God and it, the reality of God. Uh, but so, take away uh, man's, think away from man's, it's uh, symbolic dimension where God inhabits, I think. And not even eating meat is permitted anymore. The destruction of the symbolic dimension is an old objective of Marxism, as we saw, uh, or as I try to suggest. Uh, first, they tried it by reducing man to an economic animal, the reductio ad economicum. Now they have something else, even more powerful, the reductio ad climaticum. And uh, together, thanks to hegemony, the concept that uh, all the causes uh, are linked, uh, the, the causes like the, the, the banners of the left, uh, you, when you accept that sort of um, reductio ad climaticum, there come together gender ideology and oikophobia as well, the other instruments of, of globalism. So uh, everything that you can use, basically, to divide, to divide the people and to subjugate the people is good. Uh, it's curious because for some time, at least uh, in theory, the left wanted to unify the people, or so they said, but now they realize that the people are against them. And so they try to fragment the people, to destroy the unit of nation, to destroy the family, and to destroy the unity of human thinking itself. Uh, in the past, there used to be uh, social problems. There still are social problems. Uh, but history showed that they could be addressed without resort to Stalinist dictatorship, uh, as have been the case uh, to a large extent, in, especially in developing, uh, developed countries, but also in developing countries. Uh, what was the social question? It was not the real drive for uh, people who wanted, wanted to establish socialism or communism. The social question, social problems, social injustice was only a pretext for dictatorship. Now they are doing the same with the climate. We're trying to. Uh, you don't have to dis disrupt your whole economy to reduce emissions, even assuming that emissions control the temperature. Actually, the United States is the only developing country reducing emissions, although it's not trying to, just because of technological advance. Uh, but uh, uh, for some reason, or for reasons that we uh, think we understand, uh, the most drastical solutions are sold 
like they were the um, only ones uh, that can face the challenge. So, uh, what, and I'm about to, to finish, so don't worry. Uh, uh, so, what happens is that uh, Brazil is being authorized to uh, use the term uh, dear, I think, to some thinking uh, of the left. Uh, we're becoming, together with maybe with President Trump, President Bolsonaro is becoming the, this big other, the one who is, it is lawful to, to hate. Uh, another uh, mark, I think, of uh, this sort of uh, leftist ideology. They always need uh, this sort of uh, big enemy. And uh, we are being authorized basically because, as I said, we're trying to uh, 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 stray away from the uh, globalist pack. So uh, for us who care about those issues, I think we can say that uh, the main issue, the main thing at stake now uh, is uh, uh, dignity of the human being uh, and not anything else. And today, because of the way they use the climatism uh, as their main uh, fighting instrument, the Amazon is ground zero of the fight against globalism and for the recovery of the human being in its fullness. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me see, is this microphone is on. Can you hear me? Perfect. Nope. All right, I think we're on now. Perfect. Thank you so much for those introspective and deeply philosophical remarks. I wish I had a pen and paper with me to take notes, but I'll make sure to rewatch this event again. We have about 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, we have some microphones going around. So if one, please wait until I call on you and if you could please identify yourself with your name, the organization that you are affiliated with, and please keep your question in question form. The only person to make remarks here is the foreign minister. Thank you. Let me see if you could please raise your hand if you have a question. We have gentlemen here. Well, actually, members of the media, I think we will have about a few minutes at the end of the event. But you know what? I called on you first. So I'm going to give you an opportunity. Can you wait till the microphone? We have a microphone coming up right here. Thank you so much. Is that okay to make the question in Portuguese or do you prefer in English? English, please, if you don't mind, because we're recording it. If you would like to ask a question in Portuguese at the end of the event, would you mind waiting to the end? No, that's okay. I'll, I'll go for it. Ministro, uh, you said two things that it's very rare to hear in presentations like this. One is the symbolic dimension, and the other one is the dictatorship of the climate or climatism. Would you, would you explain why you decided to have those topics in this presentation, and could you explain a little bit more about them? Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Luis Fernando. Um, well, uh, I always think it's important to try to go beyond the surface and try to uh, explore the uh, intellectual and uh, spiritual, so to say, uh, infrastructure that is, that is beneath the uh, economic and political uh, uh, events and, and developments. So. Uh, uh, I try to make a, a suggestion of a, a way of research. I don't uh, think I have the, the truth about, about anything. It's just a suggestion of uh, trying to look at the, uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of deeper uh, dimension. Uh, I do think that the human being is uh, uh, governed by uh, uh, its uh, thought, call it, or its uh, interior, call it soul or spirit or whatever, or, or, or reasoning, and uh, that's where things actually happen, right? So uh, the uh, uh, economic, political phenomena are a consequence of what people think. I think that's, that's basically it. So if people, like I think is the case today, uh, have so much difficulty, it's not, I guess not the case of people here, I know, but uh, in the culture as a whole, uh, people have so much difficulty in thinking beyond the immediate reality and have so much difficulty in analyzing things in a non-emotive uh, way when they react immediately without reasoning, without looking for information about uh, 
impulses that they, that they receive, uh, I think we have a problem and that we should analyze that. And I try to formulate that as the uh, loss of the, uh, of the symbolic faculty. Um, and regarding uh, climate, what was it? The expression? Dictatorship. Climate dictatorship. Did I use the expression? Yeah. Okay. Uh, good. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, as I said, I tried to, to put it. Uh, uh, I want to distinguish what is uh, the phenomenon of climate change and the way it should be studied, which I think is scientifically. Uh, looking at the value of the uh, theory that it is uh, basically controlled by CO2 emissions, uh, which I, from what I have studied, not being a scientist, I think there some lack of evidence for, but some people think there are a lot of evidence, but uh, I think there's a question of scientific debate. But my problem is not with that, it's with the political use of uh, climate change and, and climate alarmism. And uh, what we see today in the political debate around the world, uh, like here, for example, for me, it seems that it's a question of uh, uh, ideology, it's a question of using uh, uh, the impression the, uh, of a phenomenon in order to uh, attain some political goals without going back to the real serene, calm, scientific study of the phenomenon. So, uh, and uh, I think that in the past has been the, uh, uh, the mark of, uh, yeah, maybe dictatorships uh, where you don't uh, really analyze reality because you don't have the symbolic dimension. Uh, but you just react to impulses and uh, are led to sometimes wrong decisions because you don't analyze things. So that's basically it. All right, let's go to this side of the room. The gentleman here in the front, please, if you could just wait quickly for the microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister, for your, your presentation. Um, one of the f frustrating things... Or could you just quickly identify yourself? Oh, Thank sorry, you. Alfonso Aguilar, International Human Rights Group. Uh, one of the frustrating things about the criticism of new populist, populist leaders like President Bolsonaro or President Trump by the left is this immediate attack that they're autocratic. Sometimes they even go and say and use the word even fascist. Uh, as you said in your presentation, President Bolsonaro, just like President Trump, have embraced liberal economic policies which uh, call for less government intervention. Ironically, they propose policies that would call for more governing, government intervention in the lives of people. Uh, so, in a sense, uh, uh, what they're proposing is more autocratic than what the, the new populist leaders are proposing. Uh, could you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Alphonse. Um, well, one way of approaching that is the, um, this traditional... Uh, in this case, not Stalinist, but Leninist uh, uh, dogma or advice that, uh, to his followers that you should uh, criticize your enemies but what, what you do and call your enemies what you are. Right? So uh, the autocratic uh, 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 slander is uh, basically that, I think. Uh, uh, and I think you're totally right. How can you be autocratic when you're for a more opening? How can you be autocratic like... People who know Brazil here know there, I think there has never been the amount of uh, independence among the three branches of, of power. Uh, and uh, the executive is just one of them, and we try to navigate 100% uh, uh, inside the Constitution to try to do the things that uh, the president has been elected to do, and uh, his team uh, is uh, trying to help him with. So um, uh, I think it's very hard to... Uh, to argue with that, but then we come to the uh, this uh, uh, question of words without reality behind. You just say the word autocratic, and people react to that. Yeah, it's autocratic. But okay, so prove me, or, or at least give me a, a hint of why is it autocratic, right? And uh, sometimes there is a vague thing, but uh, it's uh, there, there never appear uh, really uh, the base for people who call us uh, autocratic. So uh, I think we come back to the question of. Uh, the misuse of words, the use of words as uh, tools for, uh, for that sort of uh, collective uh, hypnosis and not tools for uh, examining and studying reality. 
All right, we have a question over here on the left side of the room. Thank you. Hi, thank you, Minister. Uh, my name is Isabella Patriot. I'm, I'm a PhD student at the University of Sao Paulo. I would like to know if uh, treating the uh, climate change as ideology or in some part denying it can uh, turn the international trade of Brazilian meat harder um, in this situation. Good. So, um, well, everything I said, I think it was uh, or most of a good part of what I said was trying to explain why I consider that the uh, phenomenon of climate change has been captured uh, for political purposes. And uh, I think that question points exactly in that sense. Uh, uh, I think in order to, uh, to impose uh, all kinds of control that people sometimes advocate because of a perceived climate crisis, you need to have some sort of uh, strong evidence for that. Uh, right? Uh, if uh, you say, that, oh, our country is at war and uh, we need to uh, break uh, the rule of law, we need to imprison potential spies, okay, that's, that's uh, tenable. But then at least you have to, to see the war somewhere. You have to, uh, well, but uh, now we just, okay, you, it's like you uh, say, oh, there's a war and okay, let's uh, imprison everyone. Uh, that is a threat, but uh, where's the war? No one saw the... Uh, the the, uh, the fire is being shot. So just to exaggerate exaggerate a little bit, but uh, so and and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, trade can be a, yeah can be a victim of that sort of uh, of ideology. But um, for example, countries like uh, Germany are very sensible uh, and uh, with lots of lots of good sense in the dialogues we had with them them since this uh, episode started. They uh, they want to uh, do trade with us. We want to do trade with them. Uh, they, um, uh, I believe they committed uh, the uh, European Commission to uh, make a study about the real uh, impact or real dimension of fires in the Amazon. And it showed that it's basically on average. Uh, some fire a little bit more than last year, a lot less than uh, a few years back. So, uh, and uh, I think it's a good example of uh, non-ideology, of... Uh, Looking at the problem and uh, situation, and trying to examine it according to the uh, to the uh, data of reality, and not just jumping to uh, to conclusions and say, "Oh, Brazil is destroying the forest, so let's uh, harm Brazil." Uh, okay, so, uh, and uh, I think that's a real a real question of uh, of reality versus ideology here. Thank you. We have time for one more brief question. The woman right here with the black jacket. Thank you. Hi, Minister. How are you? Uh, Claudio Trevisan. I'm a non-resident fellow at the Foreign Policy Institute at SAIS. I'd like to talk about a subject that is discussed a lot in this city, which is China. And in your view of this fight for the West civilization, where do you see China? And a more concrete question is what can you expect from President Bolsonaro's visit to Beijing later this year? Thank you. Good. Thank you, Claudia. Nice to see you again. Um, so, um, I think uh, China is a country that uh, navigated very well uh, globalization. Uh, uh, that's uh, their, totally their merit. They, uh, I think, probably the country that got the most out of uh, globalization uh, and uh, uh, became a much uh, more prosperous uh, nation, thanks to uh, uh, all those uh, economic changes, and uh, that's uh, part of of reality now. Of course, this created uh, some imbalances. I believe that's the case. I don't want to comment on U.S. trade policy, but it seems to be the case uh, from a U.S. Uh, point of view. Uh, and it's not, I think, China's fault, but it's a, it's a problem for some people. In, in the case in, in the US. So um, uh, I basically see uh, it in a very practical way. For, for Brazil, it's been different. Brazil uh, uh, has benefited a lot from trade of China. There's been some downside in terms of uh, some sectors that we, we lost due to uh, Chinese competitiveness. But again, that's 
not again, nothing against China in that. It's just a recognition of their success and, and some of our failures. And uh, we're trying to also uh, address those imbalances from our point of view. Uh, and uh, our coming visit to China is part of the effort to, uh, uh, to address that, uh, to have more access to the Chinese market in uh, uh, sectors that we're not presence, uh, present with, and negotiate that uh, the same way with uh, the uh, uh, interest that China has in, in Brazil. It's an, what we want is to perform a normal uh, set of negotiations where each one has his cards and we try to arrive at a common beneficial uh, uh, results. We do have the feeling that in the past, Brazil didn't negotiate well with China. We didn't use well our cards. And uh, I mean, again, no, no fault of China, fault of uh, our uh, negotiators. And now we're uh, trying to, uh, to build that, to, to keep what we have, but build from, uh, from that. So I, I don't see at all any sort of adversarial relationship with, with China. Uh, I think it's a total uh, uh, co cooperative uh, uh, relationship uh, that can come in, in mutual benefits. And by the way, China, uh, through, for example, their uh, charge d'affaires in Brasilia, during this all this turmoil against uh, about the uh, the Amazon, uh, expressed very clearly their support for Brazil sovereignty. That's been extremely important to us, and uh, we we do recognize that. So uh, that's basically uh, how we approach it. Thank you. Perfect. And with that, Foreign Minister, thank you so much. It's really been an honor and a privilege to hear from you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.